Good morning, and welcome to the services at the Franklin Church. We're glad that you're here today. What a wonderful day we have to come and to worship God, to give him the praise and the glory and the honor he so richly deserves. So we're just so grateful that you're here. And for those that are watching on Facebook Live, thank you so much for inviting us into your homes. And this time, if you don't mind, if you'd hit the like and share with us so that we can reach more. Uh, we appreciate that. If you'll look at the pew in front of you this morning, you'll see a connection card. If you don't mind getting it, filling it out, passing it to the inside aisles. We have some young men that are anxious to come and pick these up for us. Thank you so much for doing that. We're just so happy to announce that tonight we're going to be open for Sunday evening worship. So we invite you to come at 630 tonight. We're going to be meeting in the fellowship hall right behind this auditorium. We're going to have a period of singing and prayer and uh, hope that you bring your Bible, maybe a little notebook with you, because we're going to review some of the things that we talked about this morning in tonight's class. So we invite you to, to come and be a part of that. We're excited today that Stephen started his class um, he's studying the book of Acts, and we're just so glad to have a second offering for you in Sunday school, and several of you attended his class. I know he'll do a good job on the book of Acts. Camp's just right around the corner. I'm just so excited about that. It begins June the 20th and goes through the 25th, so it's time to get your applications in. If you'd hurry up with that, well, we'd appreciate that. It helps us plan, and we're just so excited about camp so if you get those in i'm just so happy this morning to announce that travis and jenna utley and their two children if you don't mind standing this morning they are going to place their fellowship with us here at franklin they have two sons kingston and joe and we're just so excited that they're going to be a part of us this morning <laughs> I do have one little announcement to make uh, Kristen Crafton continues to do well, and we want to continue to pray for her. And she's still in the hospital, and but the family does ask at this time that they not have visitors. So we'll continue to pray for her and look forward to being with her again soon. Now we'll begin with a prayer. For this day, we thank you for allowing us to come here and worship together under one roof, Lord. We pray that you be with each and every one of us and let our minds be looking looking to you, Lord, during this service. We pray that you be with all those on the sick list and help them get back to full health, Lord. We pray that you be with each of those that are leading the service and let the word speak to thy word. In your son's name we pray, amen. Sing the song for Lord's Supper. Man of sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came, ruined sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Engulfing root in my place, condemned he stood, sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah! What a savior! Lifted up was he to die. It is finished was his cry, now in heaven exalted. 
If you would, if you have your Bibles, I'm going to be reading um, several verses this morning from the book of Luke, chapter 23. Luke chapter 23, and we're going to be starting in verse 33. <clears throat> Might seem a little unusual, but this is one of my one of my favorite passages. If you'll follow along with me. And when they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right and the other on the left. But Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots, dividing up his garments among themselves. And the people stood by looking on. And even the rulers were sneering at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if this is the Christ of God, his chosen one. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming up to him, offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. Now there was also an inscription above him, This is the king of the Jews. And one of the criminals who were hanged there, was hurling abuse at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other answered and rebuking him said, Do you not even fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he was saying, Jesus... Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said unto him, Truly, I say unto you, Today you shall be with me in paradise. That last verse, verse 43, is why this is one of my favorite passages of Scripture. As we read this morning, maybe you paid special attention to the things that our Lord endured before he died upon the cross. It doesn't even tell all of the things that he endured. He was beaten. He was spat upon. Um, he was mocked. Um, he went through many things that I'm pretty sure I couldn't. I couldn't. I couldn't take it. Um, our Lord and Savior did some things there that were almost unbelievable, um, and He did it for us. And. What's really neat about this, and I, I hesitate to say that because I don't, I don't want you to take that the wrong way, our Lord and Savior really suffered. And I don't think sometimes we have any idea of what he really went through on the cross for us. But at the end of that passage, as I was reading it, there's two thieves hanging on a similar cross, one on each side. And one of them is doing the same thing that everybody else is doing, and yet one is hanging there realizing that he's there because he deserves to be there. And our Lord says to him, Truly, I say unto you, you shall be with me today in paradise. We as Christians have that hope that we will hear those words someday because of what our Lord and Savior did for us. And I hope as we gather around the table this morning, we can think of the suffering that Jesus Christ went through for us and that we can really focus on that and understand maybe in some way the suffering that he actually went through. I don't think we ever really will be able to do that, but in some ways think on that this morning and just think about how fortunate we are that we can hear those same words someday because Jesus chose to go to the cross and die for us. And I'm, I'm extremely thankful this morning that he was willing to do that. So as we bow our heads and we give thanks this morning, would you think on those things? Dear Heavenly Father, we approach your throne this morning and we sing and we say, Hallelujah, what a Savior. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for Jesus' willingness to go to the cross. As we partake of this bread at this time, may we look back upon the cross and, and see his body hanging there for us. And may we partake of this in a manner to be pleasing unto thee. In Christ's name, amen.
Let's give thanks for the fruit of the vine. We also come before you this morning, and we, as we gather around this table, we, we look at this symbol, this fruit of the vine, which represents Jesus' shed blood upon the cross. And without him being willing to go to that cross and, and suffer death and, and shed that blood for us, that, that sacrifice, that perfect sacrifice for us, we would have no hope. As we partake of this fruit of the vine this morning, may we look back upon the cross and realize the blood that was shed on our behalf. May we do so in a manner pleasing unto thee. In Christ's name, amen. This concludes the observance of the Lord's Supper this morning. It is a convenient time for us to give back and take up a collection for the work of the church. Would you bow with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all that you do for us. We are blessed uh, beyond understanding. We are blessed way more than we should be. Uh, there are so many things that you have done for us. There are so many things that you have given to us that we have in our possession. We thank you for the opportunity this morning that we have to take what you have given to us and give back to you, belonging to you from the start. The collections that we take up this morning, may we take those and use those to further the borders of your kingdom, to do good things within the community, to help others that need help, to do the things that we need to do for this congregation here at Franklin. And as we give back this morning, may we do so with a cheerful heart, and may we do so in a manner to be pleasing unto thee. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. morning scripture reading be from Matthew chapter 5 verses 14 and 16 Matthew chapter 5 verses 14 and 16 you are the light of the world a town built on a hill cannot be hidden neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl instead they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. I get a little dry up here. <clears throat> Live for Jesus, O oh my brother, his disciple ever be. Render not to any other what alone the Lord should be. Live for Jesus, live for Jesus, give him all thou hast to give. On the cross, the world's redeemer gave his life that thou mightst live. Live for Jesus, wandering sinner, under Satan, serve no more. Of the promise, prize a winner, thou mayst be when life is o'er. Live for Jesus, live for Jesus, give him all thou hast to give. On the cross the world's redeemer gave his life that thou mightst live. Live for Jesus, in life's
last morning at the noontide hour be his and that eve when day is turning and inherit endless bliss live for jesus live for jesus give him all thou hast to give on the cross the world's redeemer gave his life that thou my live <clears throat> What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure. One of my favorites. Oh Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the world thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power through. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how shall come with a shout of acclamation and take me home what joy shall fill my heart then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim my God how great thou and sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great. Good morning. 
Thank you, Keith, for the good job you did in leading our singing this morning. There's some of my favorites, too. Thank you so much. I appreciate Jimmy Parker and the good job he did in, in uh, centering our thoughts around the Lord's table. And what a good job Adam did in reading the scripture from Matthew chapter 5, which we're going to talk about again in just a few minutes. And to begin our service this morning by the announcement of Travis and Jenna Utley and their two children with us this morning, just a grand thing to announce. To have someone else in our, fam in our fellowship and family is just awesome, and we appreciate that so much. Appreciate that family. They're already active in our church, and we appreciate what they're doing. They've already signed up for camp and both uh, to work and to attend, and we're just so grateful for this new family. In 1959, Vince Lombardi was the coach for the Green Bay Packers. They had the worst season the Packers had in their history. They lost 10 out of 12 games. And you'd think things had gotten as bad as they could get, and, and coach thought, well, surely things will improve. Well, the next season they lost the first five games. He calls a meeting. He calls his teams together. He goes, okay, fellas, here's the deal. We're going to go back to basics. This is a football. A guy by the name of Max was in the back of the room, and he was notorious for being a cut-up. He goes, wait a minute, coach. You're going too fast. LAUGHTER but, you know, the truth of the matter is you got to go back to basics. If you're not blocking, if you're not tackling, if you're not passing, if you're not catching, if you're not kicking, if your special teams aren't working, if you miss the basics, you're not going to win many games in NFL. And so the lesson we're going to look at today in Luke chapter 10 is a story of where, where Jesus reminds us to go back to the basics. So if you have your Bibles this morning, let's go ahead and be turning there as we look at this familiar story. Jesus had stepped out on the religious scene in Israel. And the most visible examples of, of Judaism were going on at this particular time, and they were imposing these rules on everybody, and they were asking everybody to follow the rules and regulations. And Jesus is saying, you know, we don't have to do that. Let's get back to the basics. And he just took his 12 and he sent them out in the world and, and he told them to proclaim that the kingdom of God is here and they were doing a good job. And so he chooses 70 more. And earlier in that chapter, at the end of chapter 9, he sends them out and they do a good job and they return and he's praising them. He's thanking them for a job well done. But then a lawyer challenges our Lord. And, you know, um, this is as familiar a story as we have in the New Testament. If I, were, if I were to go up and down the pews today, and if I were to ask you to tell me the story of the Good Samaritan, I would just take a chance on it that everybody here could probably tell me. And if we were to go down the streets of Franklin, and we, we just choose people walking down the street, and you'd say, hey, can you tell me something about the Good Samaritan? They probably could. Since we do live in a region known as the Bible Belt, they can probably get pretty close to what the story actually says. But you know, we have abused this story from time to time. And any time we see an act of kindness and something really good, people will say, well, we're a good Samaritan or you're a good Samaritan. Well, while that may be true in and of itself, that term was never meant to be used as just simply doing a good deed. And I, I think our Lord's wanting us to get back to the basic. He, he uses this story. It, it, it has such a good meaning. Here's a guy. He, he's, he's, a, he's from Samaria. He's traveling. He, he's a member of one of the most unpopular religious groups. He's, he's going down a dark, dangerous road. He, he, he sees a guy that has been robbed and had his clothes stripped off of him. He has pity on the guy. The Greek there that, that, that it's used to describe, it's stronger than what I can actually say, but it, what it basically means is his guts rose up in him. He was so upset when he saw what had happened. He just got so disturbed within 
that he had to do something. He had to stop. And so being a good Samaritan means going out of his way to help a stranger that was in need without any expectation of thanks or recognition. It wasn't going to be in the Franklin favorite. It wasn't going to be in the Logan leader. It wasn't going to be in the Park City Daily News. It wasn't going to be in the Tennessean that this guy did this. He did it without any thanks or recognition. And so as we look at this story today that is so familiar with us, I want us to look at this story and draw some new conclusions from it. I, I want us to see the, basically what he's trying to share with us. So let's begin. Let's look at this question. So look at verse 25. The lawyer stands up to test Jesus. And he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do? What must I do? That's, that's a complex question. It, it was really a question that you shouldn't ever ask because to inherit, we don't do anything to inherit, right? It's, our, it's done for us. So if, if, if our parents left us, it's not what we did to inherit it. They just left it to us. If we had a rich uncle or aunt that thought enough of us and left us their inheritance, is not what we did. It's, it's what they do. And so he asked a question he shouldn't even ask because to inherit eternal life, it, it's what the Father did, not what we do. We inherit eternal life because what Jesus Christ has done for us. But yet the world we live in teaches us do, 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 and do more. When Christianity says, I will inherit eternity because it's, it was fixed several years ago by Jesus Christ, and I will inherit this. It's the gift of eternal life. It's going to be given to me. And so our, our Lord goes on, and he answers the question for the guy that asked that. And he says, what's written in the law? How do you read it? And he says, well, you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. He said, you've answered this correctly. Do this, and you will live. But he wanted to be noticed by everyone. He wanted everybody to understand exactly who he was and the title that he had. He wanted everybody to see just how smart he was, so he challenged our Lord one more time with this question. He says, who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? We've been studying the book of Romans on, in Sunday school on Sunday morning, and, and we basically came to the conclusion when we're talking about who is our neighbor. Our neighbor is everybody. Everybody. It's not just some small circle of friends that, that we've gathered ourselves around. He's talking about having to love your enemies. And, 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 and the lawyer was asking, well, how many people does this really include? Because I really like who I, I'm running with. And for me to get outside my comfort zone, is everybody really my neighbor? And so he gives this illustration. And I want us to notice that Luke in his writings does not refer to this as a parable. Neither does our Lord. So this could have been an actual story. I, I don't know for sure. But, a, you know, a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And, and this story is just, it's so good. It could have possibly happened. So let's begin reading in verse 30. In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. And they stripped him of his clothes. They beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him, and he went to him, and he bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his donkey and took him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you 
for any extra expense you may have had. Now, people were familiar with this road from Jerusalem to Jericho. This road fell about 4,000 feet in altitude. Now, I've had the opportunity to hike the Grand Canyon, and I went in on the south side of the canyon, and I hiked the, the Kaobab, South Kaobab Trail. When I started, it was at 7,250 feet. When I hiked from there all the way down to the Colorado River, it was 2,250 feet. So those of you that hike and enjoy that, you, un you understand the magnitude of that. That's tough because every step you took was going down. And I had 34 pounds in my pack. And I mean, my old knees were, they were going, what are you doing to me? I didn't, know, I didn't ask for this. I didn't train enough. And I did train, but it, it was hard. It, it was tough. And about halfway down, they did have a ranger station. Um, there wasn't a ranger there. They really couldn't help you, but at least halfway down, you sort of knew where you were, and there, there was water there and, and a place where you could get out of the hot sun. When this guy was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and falling in an altitude of 4,000 feet, halfway down, they had a place that was there that was known as the end. And the reason there was an end that was halfway there is because of people like me now that would have trouble making that kind of a hike. I couldn't do it in a day. Whether if you were young, you could probably make that hike within a day. But that's why that end was there, so you could stop and you could get some food. Or you could get refreshment. You, you could feel better. And so uh, I, I think that was extremely interesting, that particular story. But... The guy's money was taken. He was robbed. They even stripped him of his clothes. Clothing, if you had good clothing back then, it was extremely valuable. They took his clothes. They left him bleeding. They left him thinking he was going to die. The racial element of this story was not told by Jesus. However, we do know that uh, a priest... And a Levi probably failed their own countrymen, not taking care of him. Then a despised Samaritan came by and helped him. And so in this story, Jesus basically tells us there's three attitudes here that I want you to see. I want you to see that what yours is mine, I'll take it. Now that's the thoughts of a robber, isn't it? I mean, they don't, they don't care. They, they like what you have. They're going to come. They're going to take it. They're not going to announce when they're going to do this. They saw this guy. They robbed him. They beat him. They took what they wanted. You know, there's a lot of us today that have that similar attitude. What's yours is mine. I'm going to take it. The world owes me something. I don't owe the world anything. I live in a society where everything should be given to me. G. Gordon Lilly says, the world is a bad neighbor. There are people who are like the robbers, and they say, what's in it for me? Well, what's yours is mine. I'll take it. Then, what's mine is mine. I'll keep it. Income tax records reveal, on, on an average, if you have a politician that makes over $100,000 in a year, they give less than 1% of their income to charitable organizations. They feel like the government should do it, that they should. And it's easy for us to get involved in our own personal world and, and to neglect those around us. And, and these religious leaders, the Levites, the priest, they were preoccupied. They were busy. They had more to do than to help this man. And listen, they weren't bad guys. They just didn't help. They were just too busy. And, and that stretch of the road was dangerous. And they're probably thinking, well, this is a setup. The guy's really not hurt. Maybe if I go down there and try to help the guy, somebody will come out of the bushes and they'll rob me. I don't know. Perhaps they thought somebody was lurking in the distance. But yet, I see myself in, in this picture some. Do you? I mean, just think about it. 
This passage of scripture sometimes serves as an ugly mirror to, to how we act. The other evening, Frank Cardwell and I went to visit someone in the hospital, and when we were leaving the hospital, I was backing out in my truck, and this man approached me, sort of caught me off guard. He approached me, and he says, Mr., I need a ride to the bus stop. I live on Murfreesboro Road, and I'm out here at, at the hospital, and I need to get to the bus stop, and it looks like rain, and, and it, it was thundering in the background and raining to light. And he says, Could you, do you mind taking me to the bus stop? Well, since I worked in that area for 10 years, I knew exactly the bus stop he was talking about, so I said, sure, get in. So we put him in the truck, and off we go. <laughs> well... He starts telling us his story, and I'm thinking he's going to ask me for money any minute. Isn't that sad? I just what come, I thought he's going to ask. Man, what am I going to tell him? I don't have any. I, I don't pack cash anymore because of debit cards. I just don't carry a lot of cash. And I'm thinking, well, he's going to ask me, and what am I going to tell him, or what am I going to do? And I mean, all he asked for was to go to the bus stop. But see, looking at this in a, in the mirror reveals how we think about folks. He told us that uh, he'd been off drugs and he was living in a halfway house and how much it cost per week for him to get there. And he asked us about going to church and could we recommend a place for him to go. So when we got to the bus stop, I took a sheet of paper and I wrote down the name of the closest church for him to attend that I felt like could suit his needs. I, I hope he goes. He told us he was going to. I, I, and so do we find ourselves in situations like this? And, and see, the, the pattern that we read about in the New Testament teaches us to, to, to honor others before ourselves. And God has blessed us with different talents and abilities. And I hope we're not like the priests and the Levites and say, well, I just don't have the time. It would have been easy for me to say, man, I live in Franklin, Kentucky. Do you know how much longer it's going to take me to take you to this bus stop? It's going to delay me from getting all the way back to Franklin. But, you know, we just, we just didn't do it. So I think oftentimes when we're not really thinking about things, we actually rob the church. I've heard the expression, God gave me a gift not for me, but for you. And God gave you a gift not for you, but for me. And if I don't use the gift God's given me, I'm robbing you. And if you're not using the gifts that God has given you to help me, you're robbing me. So let's think about these things. And then there's the third attitude. What's mine is yours. I'll share it. William Barclay says, in a world that is bent on getting, the Christian must be bent on giving what we keep we lose what we have we give and that should be our attitude regarding regardless of the connection of that person total stranger or someone you've known for several years several years ago in the Courier journal there was an article about a group of men and women that were taking a bar exam you know when you take that exam you only have a certain amount of time to take the test halfway during the test this man becomes ill and he's thinking he's having a heart attack he falls out of his chair everybody continued with the test finally two men to his left couldn't take it anymore and they get up and they help the guy they do CPR and they try to keep the guy going until help could arrive Help finally comes, they take the guy out, and then all of a sudden the time expired and they couldn't finish their test. And they said, but man, th this guy got sick, he fell out on the floor. And they said, we are terribly sorry, but you cannot retake the test. The public outcry uh, upset about this, that in due time, these two men got to take their exam. Isn't that something? Matthew chapter 25, verse 37 says, Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? 
When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison to go visit you? And the king will reply, I'll tell you the truth. Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. And, and Jesus is basically saying to us, you know, while you're striving to be a good Samaritan, watch your motives. Why are you giving? What is the purpose? Why did you share? Warren Wiersbe says, if our motive for serving is anything other than the glory of God, what we will do will only be a religious activity and not true Christianity. Interesting thought. Helen Keller said, I long to accomplish what a great and noble task, but my chief duty and joy to accomplish humble tasks as though they were great and noble. Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount, You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Glorify you? No. Glorify me? No. How about the church? No. Glorify your Father in heaven. Let your light shine. That's, that's, a, that's a reason why this becomes long-term commitment. That's what the lawyer could not understand. He tells them the story, and it doesn't end there. He says to them, Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied the one who had mercy on him and jesus said go and do likewise jesus saying you know don't be don't don't be so concerned about who your neighbor is just be proactive find him it's sort of like you know mr rogers saying won't, won't you be my neighbor we don't have to look far to determine who our neighbor is so i want to challenge us today with three words. The first word is compassion. Love means feeling compassion. When the Samaritan saw this guy, he had compassion. He felt for him. He hurt for him. And you know, I, I think we become so desensitized to things. We, we see so many things on television that we... we or the games that we play, or on and on that des desensitizes us to stories like what we just read. We see a lot of murders on television. We, we read a lot about them. We, we play games that, that contains this. And I, I just want us to be very careful. I think it hurts us with our compassion for folks. We become desensitized, and so we don't see the need because... We either think, well, somebody else would do it, or, or I could get hurt if I helped with it. But we're relationship-oriented people. And if we are, then we understand who our neighbor is. In Second John chapter 1, verse 12, it says, I have much to write to you, but I do not want to use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to visit you and talk with you face to face so that your joy might be complete. Have compassion on folks. And then action. Love is not just feeling compassion. It's getting involved. Get out of your comfort zone. Help those that you don't know. Show Go the extra mile. You know there's not a traffic jam on the extra mile. You just won't find one. So just go the extra mile. And, you know, we, we are a friendly church here, but let's, get, let's, let's just don't stop at being friendly. Let's get active. Let, let's, uh, let's find people that need help outside of these walls. And then the third word is sacrifice. This man risked his own life to help this guy. He sure did. Sacrifice is giving up something you love for someone that you love more. Special needs call for special expressions of love. And your neighbor doesn't have to be somebody that you don't know. It could be a family member. 
could be a close family member. Now let's just remember what the writer said in 1 Corinthians 13. And now these remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. So this morning, I, I hope we'll think about getting back to the basics. It's not that hard. It's pretty simple. You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And if, we, if we've lost our first love, if we've lost our love to Jesus Christ, how about repenting? Let's pray about things. Maybe you haven't accepted the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Maybe you'd like to. Maybe you need to come today and confess his name so that he'll confess your name before his Father. And be put in the waters of baptism, having your sins your, completely washed away, starting all over, a new babe in Christ. Having your name written on the Lamb's Book of Life. And receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Whatever your need is this morning, I hope you'll get back to basics as we stand and sing. Feast, come for the table now is spread. Ye famishing, ye weary, come, and thou shalt be richly fed. Hear the invitation, come hear the invitation, praise God for full salvation. For whosoever will, all things are ready, come to the feast, leave every care and worldly strife, come feast upon the love of God, and drink everlasting life. He Come hear the invitation. Praise God for full salvation. For whosoever will. with me please dear Heavenly Father we want to thank you for the privilege and freedom we have come out today we want to thank you for this country we want to thank you for Jesus the opportunity that we have to someday be called to live with you in paradise please be with the sick especially the ones of our number Miss Ray uh, Mark and others I can't remember a special blessing of them, the ones that wait on them and their families. Strengthen them and just lay your hand on them. Thank you for today. Thank you for our lesson. Thank you for Steve. And thank you for Jesus. Watch over us and guide us and let us help one another. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.